No, 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 no. You have absolutely no idea how awkward it is to preach in an empty room into a camera. It's like having a conversation with a person who's staring at you and never blinks or says anything. Except you're supposed to act like everything's normal. All right, let's do this. All right. Uh, good morning, Lakeside Church and online guests. It's a good day to praise God because every day is a really good day to praise God. Although today's a little bit of a downer because we couldn't all meet here together in person. But we're going to keep chugging along online and we're going to keep meeting up this way as long as we need to. And, and uh, we'll be in contact to let you know the details. Now let's turn now to the uh, Word of God. And uh, if you've been here for a while, you know that um, we've been going through this series on King David called Portraits of a Leader, Examining His Life. We're actually going to take a little bit of a break from that and instead just kind of attend to the moment we find ourselves in right now. Because if there's anything that's clear right now, it's that, man, we are in a, a moment. And if I had to sum that up, like when my grandkids someday ask me what this was like, I think the one word that sums up the experience right now is the word uncertainty. It's not the things that we know, I think, that are bothering me and bothering everybody else right now. I think it's all the things that we don't know. It's like there's this column of questions running through our minds, and at the head of this column, they could all fit neatly under this one simple label of what in the world is happening to us. And underneath that, there's all these questions that we have to deal with surrounding that uncertainty. I mean, here's just some of them that I can think of that people have been dealing with. I mean, one is, when is this bug coming and how many people are going to get sick at once? Uncertain. Is my whole family going to get sick at home at the same time? Um, if my kids are not going to be at school and they're going to be at home, um, some of us are wondering, who am I going to get, get to watch them? And how am I going to pay the bills if I'm busy home watching them and, and, and not at work? And how am I going to make ends meet? Are my vulnerable and elderly friends going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? Do we have enough of everything? Because the empty store shelves are freaking people out. And the, the toilet paper hoarders are, uh, are apparently at work in the city of Grand Rapids. And here's the biggest two, how long until everything gets back to normal? And is this all gonna be overblown in the end? If I just know one thing this season is like, it's just the word uncertainty. And at the head of it, the question that we're all asking is, what in the world is happening to us right now? Now, what I wanna discuss with you today though, is a different question altogether. You see, it's easy to ask the question, what is happening to us, and to wonder about how we're going to get past it. And I, we need to, right? These are critical questions you need to go, through, uh, to go throughout your day. But that having been said, what I want to spend the remainder of our time together talking about is, I think, a second critical question that we should all be asking right now. And it is one that is at least as important as answering the what is happening to us right now. It's at least as important, but it's not nearly as pressing or apparent. And if we don't ask this one question, I think that we're in danger of just looking at the season of life that we're in right now, whatever that's about to be, and asking only, how can I get through this? And we may come through it on the other side, but we might come through it without the things that it could have given us. And here's the second question. If I can get you to do one thing walking away from this, it would be to start thinking about and wondering about this one question. There's the question of what's happening to us, but I also want you to ask the question, what might be happening for us right now? You see, there's two radically different ways of looking at the world. One way of looking at the world, and I think this is the default for a lot of people, is that the world is just this sort of random place and there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, and therefore, when there's times of unrest and uncertainty, there's really nothing behind it. It's just something that's happening. It's just what it is. And so the only question that matters is what is happening to us and how do we get out on the other side? And that's that. But there's another way of looking at the world altogether where you look at the world and the world is not a random place. The world is purposeful. And it's not that there's just a set of laws that govern the world that you're in. It's not something, it's someone that's over all of it. And that's the perspective of the Bible. Romans 8.28 puts it this way. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, before we get into this, there's a certain subset of people who have developed almost an allergy to this text because the way that preachers often use it 
is really unfortunate. We use it as a way to sort of get away from feelings. So somebody is grieving or they've been through something awful. And the first and easiest response people will give is, well, you know, um, God is working for the good and so you should feel better. And I think people develop an allergy to this idea that God is in control because they feel like it's, it's other people's way of saying, well, you're too blessed to be stressed or too blessed to be depressed. So, so stop feeling that way and think some happy Jesus thoughts down deep in your soul and then it won't feel that bad. And I think that's the wrong way to use this text. I mean, surely there's reassurance there, but I don't think it's about running from the problems and running from whatever experience you're in. I mean, surely Jesus knew that his friend Lazarus was gonna get raised from the grave because he was the one that would do it, and yet outside the grave he wept. No, the, the beauty of this text is I think in moments like this one, it reminds us of something very important, that nothing that's happening right now, not where you are, not who you're with, not how long you will be there, not the obstacles that you're facing. None of these things are by accident and they're not happening just to you, they're happening for you. And we can get a lot of meaning and a lot of great things if we start not only asking the questions, what's happening to me, but what's happening for me. And there's subsets of that question too. Like what might God be doing right now from that gets birthed into, what might I be able to do with him right now? And how might that change me? How might that make me better? Uh, and so in the interest of that, just sometime between now and whenever I'm done talking, uh, I would like to talk to you about three different things that God might be up to and what he might be doing right now or in any other period of uncertainty. Um, and, and here's what they are. I'll just give all three of them to you right now and then I'll explain. Number one, God might actually be showing his love to your neighbors in a unique way right now. Second, God might be working on readjusting our perspective. And finally, number three, God might be testing the foundations of our lives. Right? So loving our neighbors, readjusting our perspective, and testing our foundations. And maybe other things too, who knows. Uh, but let's just start with number one, that God might be loving our neighbors. There was this time uh, in the third century, specifically between 250 and 270 AD, where there was a plague that was sweeping through the Roman Empire, and it was so much worse than anything that COVID-19 could possibly do to us. Uh, it's written that at its peak, the city of Rome alone, so not even the whole Roman Empire, in the city of Rome alone, there were 5,000 people dying a day. And in their day, they, they didn't have hope of a cure. They didn't have hope of a vaccine. People were just dying. And so all the people who were living for now and going, there's not much of a reason for life and I've just got to get through this. Uh, they just ask, well, what in the world's going on? What's happening to us? And what's happening to us is calamity. And so they ran away from the cities. They left the sick behind who were dying. But during that exact same period of time, we know that historically, that Christianity exploded and people wondered for a long time how that happened. Well, here's how it happened. What the Christians decided to do was they decided to stay behind in the bigger cities. We actually have recorded in history that one of the, the uh, one of the, uh, oh, what's it called? One of the bishops in the area is actually quoted as having said that it was a period of great joy and you think, what in the world is going on? Well, people didn't know how to cure disease, but they at least knew that if you stayed with somebody and fed somebody and cared for them, yeah, you could catch the disease, but their odds went up dramatically. And so Christians stayed in the city and they cared for the sick and for the wounded. They loved them at risk of their own lives. And a couple things happened because of that. Number one, um, a lot of people suddenly knew that Christians loved them. And secondly, a lot of lives were saved. Now here's the thing, Christians were always commanded by Jesus to love their neighbors and, and so presumably all these people in the neighborhoods of these cities, they did love their neighbors. But until there was a moment of upheaval, the neighbors never really knew that. Until it actually costs or it's inconvenient, they didn't know that. And once they saw it really truly demonstrated that these people really cared about them, then suddenly it seemed very real that these people had something that this life could neither take from them and there was nothing that this world could give them that would be better than what they already had in Christ. And so they went looking for that. Now, look at 
You and I, I don't think are being asked to sacrifice nearly to that extent. And, and hopefully COVID-19 is just a bump in the road. But there are neighbors in your life right now who I know that you love. I've gotten to know this church over the last seven years and actually my mind is blown at how utterly transformed some of the people in this place really, really are. And I know, I know that what God's done in you has caused you to love your neighbors. But my question for you is, has there been occasion for your neighbor to actually know that? Jesus, uh, Jesus in Luke chapter 10 is asked by a guy, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, Jesus asks him, well, what do you think? And the, and the guy says, well, I, you have to love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, that's exactly the right answer. Now, of course, the point of that story is not that the guy was supposed to become good enough and God would like him because none of us can do that. And, and Jesus' answer is angled towards helping the guy see that, that you've never loved the way that God intended and you need his grace too. But when the man asks, uh, Jesus, who is my neighbor? What I find really curious is that the story that Jesus tells essentially gives this answer. Do you wanna know who your neighbor is? Your neighbor is not who you choose to be around on a daily basis. Your neighbor is who you find yourself with. Your neighbor is who you happen to be around. Now, most of us, ironically, we, uh, the people we don't choose to be around at all are our actual neighbors. Back then you'd choose who you lived next to, nowadays we don't. The, only 10% of Americans, by our best estimation, can name, name, give the name of somebody who lives on each side of their house in every direction. Now, um, I know that you love your neighbors and the people you happen to be around, but my question is, have they had occasion to understand that that's true? What we're heading into, who knows what the next couple of weeks might hold, but here's a few things that are probably true. You're probably going to have a neighbor who doesn't necessarily know a lot of people who might get sick and might not be able to go out and shop for their own stuff. You might have a neighbor who has children who they have no idea how they're gonna have them cared for while these kids aren't in school and they're wondering how they're gonna hold down a job. You might have another neighbor who, frankly, they might lose their job and uh, they were already, despite, despite appearances, they were living paycheck to paycheck and hand to mouth and, and they're in really big trouble. And they, you might think that you care about this person, but they've never had occasion to see that before. And you and I have the opportunity to step into that space and to go to our neighbors and to let them actually know how much we care for them, not because it's really convenient, but decidedly because it's, we have our own problems and it's incredibly inconvenient. You have an opportunity now to start conversations about need that frankly in a normal day you couldn't. So here's some great opportunities. For one thing, some of you already have the ability to watch other people's kids while they go to work, and you're doing that. Maybe that's what God wants to do, to show that you and he love your neighbors. Maybe there's that neighbor that, um, that they lost their job and they financially don't know how they're gonna make it. Now, if you're like me, I've got a tax return coming back and it's probably more than I need. How cool would it be and how radical would it be if each one of us knocked on the door of the neighbor on each side of us and just asked, how's your job going? Are, are you go doing okay? Um, if you need help, I'm here for you. And by the way, offer money to your church. We have a fund for people going through hard times in our neighborhood. And the opportunities may go on and on. And if you and I are just looking at how we're going to get through it, we might miss the opportunity to show our neighbors we love them because we do love them, but maybe they've just never gotten to see that before. So what might God be doing in that area? Let's go on to number two. God might be readjusting your perspective. Think back with me for a second. Just like go back three weeks ago and um, ask yourself, shoot, even one week ago and ask, what sort of things were you complaining about? I will go first. So my wife was going to the grocery store and we got to save a little money on groceries. And one of the things you have to know about me is I'm a snacker who needs crackers. And specifically, specifically, any cheesy cracker or really my kryptonite is chicken and a biscuit. It's good stuff. And the thing is, chicken and a biscuit is on sale. So my wife went shopping the other day and she's got she's to you know, save some money. And she goes to the store and she comes back with everything we need except everything I need my evening crackers. And I grumbled under my breath, look, if I'm lying, I'm dying. You can check with my wife what a pill I am about those stupid crackers. And I complained about that less than a week ago. And this, 
the silly thing about that is, frankly, I have so much variety of food in my house, and I, even if I want them, I could have driven literally 10 minutes down the road and gotten them, but instead I was sitting there complaining like, like that had ruined that part of my day. Fast forward until now, and look at, I have no doubt that food's gonna be back in stock in the next few days, but what has really been exposed is kind of the fragility of, of our world's system and how certain things can be run out sometimes. And now, I couldn't get those crackers if I wanted to. As a matter of fact, there's so many other things at the store, people just ran it right out. And here I am, sitting here feeling silly, looking back and going, man, I was so freaked out about crackers, but what a gift the availability of that even is. And I mean, what were you complaining about three weeks ago that in light of how fragile the world looks today, uh, how silly was that? Now, what would happen with me if I could go back a week, two weeks, three weeks with that little perspective? How much better would my attitude be? How much more grateful would I be? James 1.17, if you go there in the Bible, it, it says this, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. In other words, that it comes from God. And you and I tend to go throughout our days blind to how good things actually are. And when we do that, it's not just that that's bad for us, it's that it's wrong. See, God gives us all these good gifts and sometimes we need to be woken up to the fact that God not only has given us gifts we're not paying any attention to, but he's still giving us gifts today. Because <laughs> think about it for a second. The world is not ending. Probably my favorite snack crackers will be back in stock in like three days. Right, all that's happened is I've gotten a wake up call of the fact that I'm not entitled to them every moment when I want them. But you know what else is happening right now? I could sit and complain about that, but here's the reality. I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning and there's gonna be running water. That's a gift. I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and not worry about electricity. That's a gift. I'm gonna wake up tomorrow with plenty of food, with good neighbors. That's a gift. Um, I'll probably wake up not really fearing for my life because Truth be told, we have really great medicine, we have really great doctors, we don't wanna see them overwhelmed uh, with need, and we certainly wanna save the medicine for the vulnerable people who really need it. <coughs> oh my, that's not a good sign. Oof, have to edit that out. But um, we've saved all that medication, right, for people who need it, but the truth is, we have great medical technology. All this stuff I take for granted, what would change if I could see three weeks ago what I see now and be jogged into gratitude for what I have. What is that gonna change three weeks from now? Maybe it's good for me to sit and realize that a lot of the things that I take for granted are things that are actually gifts. How quickly the miracles of yesterday become the entitlements of today and how much we don't see what God does for us. All right, finally. Third and most important thing that I can think of that God might be doing what I think he actually frequently does with times of uncertainty and upheaval and fear. And that's that God tests the foundations of our lives. Every single one of us builds our life and our identity on something. For each of us, we think that there's either something about us or something we wish we could be that if we had it, it makes us whole and it makes us matter. And I talk about this all the time. Like if you've never heard me talk about this before, it's probably because you're either very new to our church or you have never been here. But I tell you this all the time, that there's so many different things you can build your life on. Some people think that what's gonna make them matter and make them whole is success. For some people, it's money. If I have enough money, I'll matter and then I'll be whole. For some people, it can be something as shallow as their good looks. That what makes me matter is that I'm a good looking, I'm a beautiful person. It could be a relationship, that if I had this one person, or because I have this one person or people, that that's gonna make me whole. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Now, here's the thing. Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter seven, he talks about how we build our lives on a foundation the same way that you build a house. Except the difference between how we build a house and how we build a life is that with a house, you know, you could build it on a rock or on sand, but the difference is when you build a house, you have a pretty good idea of what it's on, right? So I don't think any one of us is confused about whether our house is built on cement or on sand. I mean, we look and we see it's a foundation, it's a slab or it's a basement, okay? 
But if you could think of a universe in which people didn't pay attention to that, the, the results could be catastrophic. And unlike our houses, a lot of us go through our lives actually not really sure what we have at the basis of our identity. And it's there, but we're just not thinking about it until it actually gets tested. One way that it can be tested is the worst way. This is the worst thing that could happen to you is that if you actually get what you think is gonna make you matter, what happens is that you're not whole. What happens is that it eats you alive. Uh, David Foster Wallace, in a speech that he made, put it this way. He said, if what you really think is gonna make you matter, what you worship, in other words, is success, then you will always feel like a failure even when you've attained success. If it's money, you'll never feel like you have enough. If it's your beauty, then you will always feel ugly and you'll die a thousand deaths in the mirror before time finally takes you. And if it is a relationship with a person, you will either crush them under the weight of your expectations because they can never be good enough or you'll resent them endlessly for never measuring up. One way or another, the thing you put at the foundation, if you get it, what you think is your best case scenario, it eats you alive. But one of the things that God does is that he sends a storm along. He allows uncertainty or fear to come in. In other words, he allows that thing to be threatened and it can expose itself to us. Jesus talks about a storm. He says, you know, a wise man builds his house upon a rock. A fool builds it on the sand. And we're by definition fools in that regard. He says they don't notice it until the storm comes along. When the storm comes along, things get washed out from under that house and it takes the house out or it was planted on something solid and it stands. And to varying degrees, you and I have built our life's houses, our life's meaning on things that are sometimes extremely weak. And it was true whether or not it was revealed to us. Look at Right now, I think the fear that people have about what COVID-19 is about to do to them is actually worse than the thing itself. But for this, it's not really the point. It's normal to be afraid that you might lose your job. It is normal to be anxious that your kids might get sick. It is normal to be anxious and to worry a little bit about the safety of, of older or more vulnerable people. I, I, can, I can speak total truth in saying, I'm a little worried because my mom has been vulnerable to respiratory infection and it almost killed her last year. I am a little concerned about that, that's normal. But it is something else entirely when you find that part of your life is being threatened and you fear losing it and it actually causes you not only to be scared but to be angry, to be implacably bitter, to be hopeless, to be absolutely crushed. And what might be happening right now is you might be finding out if you're scared that you might lose your job, that your status is actually what you think makes you matter. If you're worried about what the stock market just did, it's normal. I'm concerned about what happened in my retirement, okay? But if what you thought was your money, that that's what was gonna make you matter and you didn't notice, one of the ways that might be getting revealed to you right now is what's happening inside your heart as you watch just a little bit of it be in peril. When we're in times of uncertainty, the storm comes. And if we completely fall apart, something that might be happening, and I don't wanna make naturally anxious people feel really bad, because it's not always this, but oftentimes this. One of the things that might be happening is your foundations might be getting washed out and it might be getting revealed. And it's not something horrible that God's done to you, but maybe instead he's trying to point you towards something a little firmer, namely himself. In the Ten Commandments, the first one is, you shall love the Lord your God, and that's, that's because that's what you were meant to do. In a lot of ways, we look to other stuff in life for things that only God could satisfy, and the best thing he could do is to reveal to us how weak that really is. Maybe that's what's happening in you, and maybe right now, God is reaching out to you. He is putting a blinking warning light in the corner of your life going, warning, warning, something's not right. This stuff can't hold your weight. Come to me, I can satisfy you. I, I love the way that John Piper puts it. John Piper is, is a famous preacher, now retired. And he, says, he always says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If what you feel right now is unstable, then maybe it's time to start building your life a little more firmly on something else. And that doesn't start with deciding to work your way back to God. That starts with going to God and talking about the fact that you're inadequate and confessing that you haven't done it right, that you're not good enough, that you haven't loved him enough, that you've loved other things, and that frankly, you don't deserve for him to take you back. At that moment when you just trust that God wants to forgive you, that's when God wants to come back in. Now, I don't know which one of these three things God might be doing in and through you, maybe one of them, maybe all of them. 
It might be that God is, wants to reveal his love in a radical way for your neighbors. It could be that he's putting your life in a better perspective. It could be that he's testing your foundations. It could be he's doing something else entirely. But here's the thing. I hope that what you've started to see in this conversation is that God has a lot more for us in these next weeks uh, where people are anxious and uncertain than for us to merely get through it. So my prayer for you is that you start to see that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to be able to not just ask the question, what's happening to me, but what might be happening for us right now? I pray that the Holy Spirit guides you to actually get involved in what he's already doing, that he shows you a better foundation on which to build your life that, that isn't blown about by whatever winds of instability are around in the world. My prayer for you is that you become more grateful, not less, and that you find that you're, you overflow in love into your neighbors because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. So here's where we're going to leave it off for now. I'll see you next week, and I don't know, we're working on some sort of a live stream solution, um, and I don't know if we're going to have music, or maybe we won't, but for now, just know that I'm praying for you, and um, I love you guys, and I can't wait to see you as soon as humanly possible. Um, so let's pray. Um, Father in heaven, I want to thank you that you have our every single moment in your hands, that you know the turns in the road in front of us before we even get there. It is so easy for us to think that it's all on us. It is so easy for us to lose sight of you and how great a comfort it is when we make eye contact with you and how good you are. And so God, I want to pray for every single person in Lakeside Church. I want to pray for everybody who is watching this that each and every one of us would find you in the midst of the next few weeks. That we wouldn't be overtaken by fear and worry, but that we'd be able to be still being firmly planted on you. And I pray that you would help us to be used to love our neighbors, open our eyes to see needs that aren't just ours in the same way that you have done it for us. Jesus, we're grateful for the blood that you've given to cover our sin, to guarantee us a better life and a better kingdom than this one that is so much better than anything that this world can give us or take away. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.